If you've never heard the agony of a doubter, the despair of a near apostate, now is your chance. In 2013, Bobby received an email from Jane, a teenage girl in the final stages of doubt, marked by depression, despair, and nearly ready to depart. We are going to hear her words and take two episodes to help people in their doubt. Welcome to Christianity Still Makes Sense, the show that loves doubters. I want to start by reading the words of Jane Doe. Listen carefully and let us know in the comments if you agree with anything that she says. Here's what she wrote. Hello, Bobby. My name is Jane Doe. I'm a 17-year-old Christian, and I've been a Christian for many years. I've always had God inside of me keeping me comforted. There's always been that comfort inside of me. But lately, I've been in what I would call a crisis of belief. Lately, I've been having doubts in my head about the Bible and what it says. For example, how is it physically possible for one to rise from the dead? Is it really God or is it all in my head? Why isn't God there to help me when I really need Him? Doesn't the Bible have scripture saying that He will help? Sometimes the doubts are statements that electrocute my mind and belief, such as you're wasting your time or you're believing a fantasy and it's only part of your brain that makes you believe. But it's not like I want to believe these doubts because when I think of them, something burns in my heart and my mind. My depression begins to act up badly. Lately, I've had anxiety attacks about it with a stress. It's not helpful when atheists surround me in school too. There really aren't many people that I can ask for help. So I'm asking you, what do I do? Because I'm scared to say I'm lost. Jane. Bobby, what did you sense? And what were your thoughts when you first read this email? Mm. I found it heartbreaking on so many levels, Tim. And obviously Jane Doe is a pseudonym for her. But I mean... When you read her words, can you sense her agony and her emptiness, her confusion, her split mind, her torment? Obviously, I responded, but unfortunately, Tim, I never heard back. And many times I found myself wondering how things ever turned out for her. Mm. But what's obvious is by the time Jane pressed send, her doubts all but appeared to be applying the final touch of full-fledged apostasy. And I don't know about you, if you're listening out there, if you've ever found yourself wandering through the agonizing land of doubt, then you know how hard it can be to find your way out. And sadly, there are lots of other teens out there suffocated by doubt who don't know where to turn. And not only are there not lots of teens out there, or that there are lots of teens out there, there are lots of adults as well. Yeah. If there is something true, it's this. Empathy goes a long way when helping people through doubt. In fact, in Jude 22, uh, we read, have mercy on those who doubt. Uh, When we bypass the heart, Tim, we fail to connect. And when we bypass the head, we'll fail to correct where Mm -hmm. needed. So we need both a head and heart approach to helping doubters. That said, there's no one size fits all approach. Uh, That's because everybody is different, which means we need to listen carefully and empathetically to people's doubts so that we can customize the best approach to helping them. Very well said, Bobby. Way to set the tone for this conversation. So let's turn to four things that people can do when they encounter somebody like Jane Doe. And you and I have both encountered people like this before. So first, if someone reaches out to you for help, validate the courage it took to ask for help. Bobby, talk to us a little bit about this. Absolutely. Uh, So she did the right thing. She reached out for help. As she said, there really aren't many people that I can ask for help. So I'm asking you. And I'm certainly glad she did. Regrettably, sometimes people don't know where to turn to him when they're battling doubt. Even more regrettably, some Christians have been taught you're never to doubt, right? And we think about that. uh, And what can we learn? Well, unexpressed doubt is still doubt. And uh, isn't it better to have expressed doubt that can at least be addressed than for someone to suffer from unexpressed doubt. (laughs) It's hard to address what's unexpressed and unexpressed doubt doesn't go away just because the doubter remains silent or stays mum. 
That said, when a doubter expresses doubt to us, I think we should consider it a tremendous honor that the individual was willing to entrust us with a piece of his or her pain. And so I was very thankful that Jane doubt, reached out for help. And while I guess I'll never know this side of heaven, uh, at least I don't 10 years later, uh, you know, how it all turned out for her, whether she received it, I do know this, it took tremendous courage for her to reach out and I wanted her to know that. Yes. Uh, vulnerability. That vulnerability piece is so important to understand. Mm -hmm. now, my channel, Dealing with Deconstruction, we have a Facebook group, and I've seen people often open up their hearts and share their honest doubts. And when people then respond with compassion, it can really make all the difference to someone Absolutely. on their journey. Yeah. Let, let's move to the second one. Second one uh, is that they have to realize that Christians aren't immune to doubt. You and I both know this personally. Talk to us a little bit about this. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, she admitted I've been a Christian for many years and perhaps her Christian uh, or perhaps her confusion was tethered to the idea that I briefly mentioned above that Christians aren't supposed to doubt. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I do know this. Um, doubt doesn't discriminate. Doubt isn't a Christian problem, it's a human problem. And in the absence of certainty, the question remains, which worldview best closes the doubt gap? I've said that statement many times. And I've also said to walk away from Christianity is to only walk into another worldview, all too ready to greet you with a new set of doubts. I've often said this as well, if Adam and Eve could doubt in paradise, how much more are we susceptible to doubting in paradise loss? So doubt is no stranger uh, when we think about to humanity um, or to Christians, everybody doubts, atheists doubt. Every time an atheist becomes a Christian, they doubted their atheism and become a Christian. Every time a Mormon doubts their Mormonism to become a Muslim, they, you know, they had to go through a doubt process. So it's not like there's one group of people that are quarantined from doubt. And the Bible's replete with doubters from Abraham or from Adam and Eve to Abraham, the psalmist, Habakkuk, Zechariah. John the Baptist, Thomas, and many others. I want to park on this because I thought it was an excellent point for just a second. Bobby, you and I got a chance to interview Justin Briley, and he talked about his new book. And in his new book, he outlines what can happen when people kind of follow the path of atheism, especially that new atheism, the four horsemen that we've all heard about. And at first glance, it seems like that they're kind of drawn to this worldview because of the, the stability of science that science can offer. But then they realize that meaning and purpose and love and compassion and, and the like can't be found in the lab. I, again, this is kind of a little bit of uh, off our, 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 our initial conversation, but sure. I, I just think that that's kind of where people are going. They're, they're looking for this almost certainty in science, but they're not mm -hmm. realizing that just what you said, that they, there's doubts in, in all worldview. And I think that that is, is just so important to kind of highlight here. Yeah, that's such a good point, Tim. I mean, uh, you think about atheism and they realize that their worldview was bankrupt. And so what did they start doing? Well, they started borrowing from Christianity. Uh, yeah. they, they, they started realizing that people have a love uh, for the sacred. And so they wanted to create sacred spaces, some of them, where you could show up and hear from, about certain readings that would provoke your thoughts. And uh, they wanted to use certain architectural space to, to kind of create a sense of awe. That would be awe, obviously, in creation, not in the creator of it. Uh, they also realized that their worldview is bankrupt as it relates to moral values. If Nietzsche's claim that God is dead was true, then the logical implication is so is everything that came along with uh, the worldview of believing in God and uh, objective morality. And then you would start to see people uh, like Sam Harris or Eric Willingberg trying to make a case for objective morality on the worldview of atheism. And so it's kind of like what atheism at first with Darwin uh, origin on the species, right? Mm -hmm. You think of that and, you know, atheism is going to, you know, explain things through natural selection and evolution and survival of the fittest. But then all of a sudden you, you start thinking about the, the challenges of just living for survival of the fittest. Okay, well, that gets problematic, especially when somebody like Adolf Hitler comes along and influenced by, you know, Darwin uh, yeah. and other thinkers. And now let's have genocide because we need to not make sure that the gene pool is polluted. And then you end up in all kinds of problems. So all that to say, Tim, is I think that your point 
is right. So they borrow from Buddhism with, with meditation and, and, mm-hmm. and they borrow from, you know, theism on, you know, but they won't call it that because they know they need objective morality, some of them. Right. And then they'll even try to find a sense of the awe, but they'll just limit it to creation. Yeah, very, very, very good, good points there. I really appreciate that. Well, let's jump to our, our third one. When we're you know, when we encounter somebody with doubt, we, we don't want to underestimate the angst that doubters feel by not sensing God's presence. And I think we saw some of this in Jane's words and her letter. So talk to us a little bit about this. Yeah, that's right. You could sense her bewilderment. She mm-hmm. said, I've always had God inside of me, keeping me comforted. And the tension she is going through is where did that go? That sense of witness, that, that sense of witness that she once knew was hanging over her like a fleeting memory. And that's because her life has been disrupted by doubt. And doubt does that, Tim. It unsettles us and it's no way to live, at least long term. Uh, you know, there's good doubts and there's bad doubts. It's good doubt if it leads us to doubt what's false that we've been holding on to, but it's bad doubt if it causes us to believe an error. And mm-hmm. so without resolve, doubts eventually lead to what Jane described as a crisis of belief. Hence the reason her comfort was all but a memory. So it's hard to feel comfort during a doubt crisis, but it's also hard to not end up in a doubt crisis if we always expect comfort. When doubters doubt, comfort turns to discomfort. Peace turns to panic. Calm turns to chaos. Clarity turns to confusion. We go from sensing God's presence to wondering if he's present at all. And that's all part of the agony for the doubter, Tim. And we can't underestimate this existential pain that this individual goes through in a season of the dark night of the soul. And the person who walks away from Christianity without first feeling flayed through the process of doubt, I would say is a person who never had an intimate relationship with Jesus to begin with. You won't find the true Christian celebrating his doubts. No, he'll loathe them. And like Jane, he'll long for God's comforting presence to visit again. Yeah, I, I, it's hard sometimes because we don't want to necessarily blame the the doubter, right? But then kind of our, our first mind place that we go is mm-hmm. what was their relationship with Christ like? What, what, how active was that? What did that look like? How often were they in the scripture? How often were they praying? And so uh, while I'm very aware of the fact that I don't necessarily want to be like, well, this is your fault that you didn't do what you needed to do. Sure. We also know very much that there are things that we can do to put ourselves kind of in that presence of God, to be able to feel that, uh, you know, to be worshiping on a regular basis, to be in small groups, to be kind of going through those discipleship processes and kind of the, the you know, trying to build the fruits of the spirit and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Maybe just for a brief second, just talk to us a little bit about um, on your way out of doubt, what were some of the things that maybe helped you to be able to some, some actions or some action steps that someone might be able to give to somebody else that could say, Hey, if you're feeling, if you're not feeling God's presence and you're feeling lonely in this instant, Mm -hmm. here are some things that help me in order to be able to walk out of that. What what, what were some of those things? Mm -hmm. It's a really good question, Tim. And you know, as I think about that in some ways, when I became a Christian at 19, I, I mean, I didn't even know the questions to ask, right? I mean, yeah. obviously the questions to ask that would find me in a Christian worldview, like what do I do with my guilt? What's the purpose of life? And Christianity answered those questions for me. Uh, and ignorance was bliss in some ways, but <laughs> you fast forward my life down the road and, you know, I'm out there after getting a four year master's degree, which basically the master's of theology, the THN, the 122 hour degree, I mean, it's equivalent to three master's degrees, the 60 hour MA plus the, you know, the MDiv and then the STM. So it's just one degree, but it's a beast of a degree. And then I earned a doctorate and then I was in my second doctorate. And so all that to say, I've been in years of studying and what was beginning to happen to me is I found myself thinking, well, how, how could I know for sure Christianity was true when I'd never really studied all the other worldviews? Hmm. And so I, you know, found myself feeling like I got to really make sure that, you know, I understand why I believe what I believe. And all of a sudden, you know, I, in that place of deep doubt, what was going through my mind is, you know, how is it that I can keep a fire for God 
with all this new information that I've collected and with all these doubts that I had to, to, to work through, because when I was younger, it felt so much easier because there was so much ignorance about all the challenges that people raised against Christianity. But what God did, Tim, is he allowed me to see the challenges, to face the challenges, and to come out with answers to the challenges, and to see that the Christian worldview was better uh, than what I could have possibly imagined. Uh, it, it also, when all was said and done, it is I ended up with a greater sense of security because now I don't sit around wondering, oh, well, what if this is right or that's right? Well. At the same token, it's not realistic that everybody have to go through and study everything out there uh, before making a decision uh, because we don't have time for that, number one. And number two, if God exists, you think he'd make a way accessible to himself uh, for people that don't have the opportunity that I was afforded to go get the education that I did. Mm -hmm. But he did use that to, for the making of an apologist. And what he would show me is there's lots of people who had great intellects that knew a bunch of stuff and ignorance was never bliss to them. And they believed. think about Augustine or Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and think about a Paul, the apostle. Uh, these would be your scholars, right? And then what was it that helped them stay strong? Well, Thomas Aquinas put down his pen after an experience with God. He says, all that I've written is but straw compared to what I've seen. Uh, Augustine had a powerful encounter where he heard children saying, hey, pick up and read. And he picked up the Bible to Romans and mm. it was the exact verse that he needed to hear. And Paul the Apostle had a Damascus Road experience. So what helped me, Tim, is to remember that powerful experiences where God met me in the past can help me to make it into the future when I can't see my way ahead. And then by having faith like a child and trusting in his mystery, it began to help me see the way out. I think for me, it was similar to that in the sense that for me, the presence of God was tied to the feeling of love of his people. And so when mm. I felt that that was kind of being ripped away, when when people that I loved and trusted and, and I thought were Jesus followers and, and probably were Jesus followers treated me poorly, I associated that with how God saw me. And my way out of it was similar to your way out of it is I found William Lane Craig. I found the one minute apologist. I found Frank Turek and Thomas Aquinas and, and Peter Kreef and other really great thinkers. And like you said, I started to root my faith back on uh, Jesus, back on him walking out of the grave, that that mm -hmm. being a, a reasonable belief that there was evidence that supported that. And right. when that became the thing that I focused on, um, the other things, you know, pieces of my faith kind of fell back into place. The relationships were easier. The trust was easier. Um, I saw God's presence where I, I wasn't seeing it before because I, I had a, a, an understanding that I, I just lacked before. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, that was kind of it for, for me, but that's good. Yeah. Tim. Well, I want to talk to the audience again. Thanks for sticking with us this far. And, and we would love to know what else that you would add to our list. We, we've mentioned three. We're, we're going to mention one more in this episode, and then we're going to do a whole other episode. So we would love to know what you're thinking, what might be on your list of things that we might be able to do when we encounter someone that doubt. And you can let us know in the comments. So if you are doing that and you're at our YouTube channel, feel free to like this video and subscribe to our channel while you're there and go ahead and share this with your network. So Bobby, as I mentioned, we have one last piece of advice. Our fourth one is to identify the type of doubt inflicting the doubter. And I think this was, again, really important for both of us is kind of identifying that. Talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, it, it, the more we can zero in and focus on what's happening it's helpful i mean think about if you were to go to the eye doctor um you know you're struggling seeing and they put those uh you know they, they have us go through a battery of tests and you're looking you know at larger numbers than smaller numbers and close one eye close the other eye they're trying to help us zero in uh, so that they can zero in on what the best prescription is for us in other words mm -hmm. they want to give us a customized set of glasses so that we can see accurately. And sometimes when uh, you know, you, you're blinded, you just want that outside doctor to kind of come in and help you to kind of assess where you are. And for Jane, she just had a bunch of questions, but to be able to make sense of them, it, it helps to know the type of doubt. For example, she asked that list of questions, you know, is it really God or is it all in my head? How's it possible for one to rise from the dead? Doesn't the Bible have scriptures saying that he will help? 
I appreciated this list from Jane because it helped me to decipher the type of doubt she was struggling with the most. In the same way that when we speak to the optometrist, we're saying, oh, I can see line four, I can see line five, oh, it's a little blurry there. I see better out of my left eye on that one than my right eye. There's assessing going on, there's fine tuning, and that's what this can do. We listen with empathy and we can begin to hear where someone's at. And so when it comes to doubt, I mean, there's different types of doubts, and this is not an exhaustive list, but there's moral doubts. This is where someone doubts what God's word says about a moral issue. Uh, you know, somebody's living in sin, for example, uh, and they want to keep living in it, but they don't want to keep struggling with guilt. Well, what will they do? Well, maybe I'll dial back the guilt by toning down God's moral law. Well, that's mm. not our right to do that. There's emotional doubt uh, where someone might struggle to reconcile all the suffering in the world with a good God. There's spiritual doubts. This is where the evil one comes along and like he did in the garden, has God said, or with Jesus, you know, tempting him uh, during his uh, wilderness fast. There's volitional doubts. Uh, this would be like doubting God's plan, doubting what God has asked you to do, that believe, doubting that that's the best thing, like Jonah, doubting that God, um, you know, knew what was right in showing the Ninevites mercy. Uh, then there's intellectual doubts where you know, one's doubts can turn suspicious and get skeptical of ever truly resolving them. Uh, while there's nothing wrong with a little skepticism, we want the right kind of skepticism. Mm. Uh, you know, when our skepticism causes us to be skeptical of truth, we should be skeptical of our skepticism. <laughs> and so for Jane, it's obvious. Uh, the type of doubt that she was primarily beaten down by was intellectual doubt. You could see that through her questions. And I think that her surrounding context was also contributing. She said, it's not helpful when atheists surround me in school. And so certainly that was probably instigating her intellectual doubts. And there would be a level of emotional doubt that I think she was also suffering from. Like, God, why are you allowing this to happen? Why do I feel forsaken? Why don't I sense your presence anymore? And so I think if we're helping someone through doubt, Tim, or someone's personally twisted up with doubt themselves, uh, then I just want to encourage that person, you know, whoever you are out there to write your doubts down and you can do this by creating a mind map. And this can be mm -hmm. a helpful exercise that allows you to zoom in on the type of doubt in need of most attention. And so what I would do in doing this is I would just lay out the five types of doubts, moral, emotional, spiritual, volitional, intellectual doubt, and just put each of those type of doubts and then write a circle, draw a circle around it. And then just start clustering off from, you know, moral doubts. What are your moral doubts? And then just start clustering off from intellectual doubts and putting circles around all the different sub doubts off of the main type of doubt. And then you can see on a page which doubt type is pestering you the most. And then starting with the one that's bugging you the most to the least, you can begin to develop a plan to hopefully start walking your way out of this dark night of the soul. And you can know this, when you come out, you're gonna have greater answers to the doubts that were once haunting you. They can become the ammunition that you use to help others who are suffering one day down the road that God will bring you across. Well, what an excellent uh, exercise. I, mean, I was wondering, well, wouldn't it be cool to kind of see people do that exercise? And if they're brave enough to take a picture and, and post it either on our Facebook page or, you know, maybe send a message to us, we would love to see kind of where, where, where you're at with some of those. Go through that exercise. Mm, let us good, know. Tim. Bobby, any final thoughts you want to leave our audience with? No, that's, uh, that's a really good point right there. I would just say if, uh, you know, you, you need to see an image of what this looks like, we could always, uh, you know, post something uh, so that you could see that and let you yeah. know where that uh, is down the road. Uh, but I think that a, doing this can be a very helpful tool to just get it on paper and then get a trusted friend, dialogue, put together a plan and ask the Lord to meet you in that. Amen. Well, you don't want to miss our next episode as we are going to look again at Jane's doubts and consider four more pieces of advice for doubters. If you enjoyed this episode or you learned something, we would love for you to check out our playlist on doubt. And you can do that on our YouTube channel. And we would love for you to leave us a comment on any one of those videos or on this video as well. And we'll meet you next time on Christianity Still Makes Sense.